You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus gear up to start making their first decisions in charge of this Chicago Bears organization, there's a lot they can learn from the mistakes of the previous regime. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm an analyst for Pro Football Focus, and I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter at Cox Sports One. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Bears. You can like Locked On Bears on Facebook. Join the Locked On Bears Facebook group for even more Bears talk. And make sure you hit that subscribe button on the Locked On Bears YouTube channel to keep up with all of our video podcasts as well. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today and hopefully every day. On the show, we go through some of the big key lessons we can take from Ryan Pace's tenure as general manager and Matt Nagy's tenure as head coach to look at what Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus not necessarily specifically what they should not do, but specifically what they can learn from you know some of the good and the bad uh, of the previous regime. As Ryan Pace now has a new job in the front office of the Atlanta Falcons, and Matt, Matt Nagy now hired back in the Kansas City Chiefs coaching staff as a quarterbacks coach. Those two brought back up in the news, kind of brought back up in my mind, what Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus can do to make sure they're not the ones going back to new organizations and taking lesser jobs in after a number of years after their turn uh, running the Chicago Bears organization. And as, as we look ahead to like free agency and the NFL draft and where this roster is right now in Chicago, I can't help but think about the, the recent roster the Bears have had. Not that Ryan Pace was the world's worst general manager, but we had some pretty distinctive flaws that we kind of identified here entering this season that ultimately led to more problems. Particularly, I think cornerback is the one this year where going into week one, we were kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if this is a, a, a good outcome, a good strategy, a good plan they have here at cornerback. And I think the lesson that that and, and other times throughout this regime was that sometimes they found, they thought that competition could be a substitute for talent. And that's not to say that competition is never a solution or it's not, I mean, it's definitely a good idea, but you need to have talent competing and not just players competing, right? It's good to have multiple players competing for roster spots and for starting lineup spots or whatever it might be. Like, yes, competition in a vacuum is a good thing, but when you have a competition at cornerback, say, and your options are Kendall Vildor and Artie Burns, that's that you don't really have one, you know, you don't really have like, not that they're without any talent, but you're not able to make up for a deficiency in like consistency, right? It's not talent is, is a broad term, but you're right. You're talking about experience, consistency, skills, difference making ability, right? That's what I mean. Like you can't just, you can't just throw a bunch of bodies at a position and, and pray that, one of them will turn out to be better than you think they are, right? Kindle Vildor did not, I mean, Kindle Vildor made progress over the year, but right, did not per- turn out to be like a starting caliber starting cornerback. Artie Burns, we kind of knew, was not a, a really a consistent NFL starting caliber cornerback from his time in Pittsburgh. And so, like, the Bears seemed to be hoping that one of those two players would be something different. And there was maybe some, you know, there was some hope or optimism. You could find reasons to say, well, maybe things could develop in one way or the other, but like, it clearly was not a substitute for having actual talent at that position. We saw, I think similarly the offensive line treated in that way in isolated positions in recent seasons, you know, like this past year after they released Charles Leno and Bobby Massey, they didn't really have like super consistent plans, at least not for like left tackle until Jason Peters came in. I mean, of course you had, you know, you drafted Tevin Jenkins and, and Larry, Larry Borum, but there was also the competition there with, you know, Jermaine Effetti at right tackle and Elijah Wilkinson in there and the Chavius Simmons. And like, it was clear that th- these rookies ended up having some of that talent, but they didn't have like a real consistent plan here. It was going to be a lot of competition to find some consistency on the offensive line. And it was a struggle to find it 
all that well. Same thing even the year before when I think back to like the guard position position and, and center to some extent where they, you know, they had kind of moved on from Kyle Long that offseason. And so they had Rashad Coward at right guard. They also had they had signed Jermaine Effetti to maybe play guard or or tackle, but they had Bobby Massey at right tackle. So Effetti was sort of competing at guard. They end up moving James Daniels over to guard and, and Cody Whitehair moves from center to get Sam Mustafer in there. And it just becomes, you know, it becomes a mess on this offensive line because again, they didn't fully stock every position with real talent. They sort of just said, all right, a competition between Rashad Coward and, and Afedi and whoever is going to produce a, a, a quality player or a quality lineup. And it just, it didn't really ever fully pan out there. I even think back to like the tight end position before Cole Komet and Jimmy Graham, you know, Trey Burton was a, uh, Trey Burton had some talent. It just wasn't staying healthy was part of it. And part of it was kind of just, scheme and if there was a weird kind of disconnect there with how Burton should be used but clearly he's kind of fallen out of the NFL a bit so it's like it's not like he's going out and, and dominating somewhere else but you remember that offseason they brought in like 10 tight ends it was I mean just a, a complete circus round table of every kind of tight end they could possibly mix into that competition behind you know Trey Burton and, and Dion Sims I think they moved on from Sims at that point but they did have Adam Shaheen and then they, right, they didn't really have actual talent at tight end. They just threw a lot of bodies at it. And it was, it produced a, or I guess it didn't produce anything sort of consistent at the tight end position. And it just felt like these last few years in Chicago, there was always like one spot that Ryan Pace wouldn't fully stock and would just throw a bunch of bodies at and say, competition will breed consistency at those spots. And it didn't breed consistency. And you can see where maybe the coaching staff is a part of this too. It's not just a Ryan Pace method uh, lesson, but like saying, well, all, well, our coaching staff will develop these guys and will therefore then produce talent from this group of bodies. Like one of these guys should be good if the coaching staff can work with them. And that just wasn't a consistently productive plan for effective team building. And it's one of those lessons I, I'm hoping that we can see Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus take, right? You should have competition at positions. I've advocated for signing another offensive tackle this season to compete with Borum and Tevin Jenkins on at the offensive tackle spots. Competition is good if you have good players competing, but not good players competing doesn't consistently produce good players, right? Because they were all not good players in the first place. And I, I'm hoping the new regime can be a little bit more careful about utilizing competition not as a replacement for talent but as a way to get more out of the talent that you have and get the best talent that you have on the field i also think the coaching staff plays a pretty significant role in getting the best out of the talent that they have something that we felt we felt like matt Nagy and, and ryan pace by extension were unable to do very consistently we'll look for the lessons from players versus scheme and adjusting the coaching to fit the players rather than the other way around, next on Locked on Bears. In the rearview window, you don't have to give up your sports betting fun all throughout the offseason because our friends at Bet Online have you covered for all of your sports betting needs, from the latest odds, totals, player performance props, to where the next fired coach is going to land. And it doesn't matter which sport we're talking about here. Because yes, there is NFL free agency props coming up, NFL combine props, Aaron Rodgers props, and so many different more futures for next season. But then you've got basketball season in full steam for both pro and college hoops. And hockey, soccer, boxing, tennis, UFC. Even if you don't love them as much as you love football, you can make those sports that much more exciting with a little bit of action at Bet Online. It's the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news all season long, regardless of what season you're interested in. Head on over to their website today or use your mobile device to learn more about all the top trends and action you need to know. Bet online, where the game starts. So many of the Bears' issues under Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace started with that disconnect it felt between like the player and what the player was able to do versus the coaching staff and how the player was implemented. And so often it, it wasn't like the Bears were like, constantly loaded with gobs and gobs of talent that the coaching staff was just unable to utilize. But it did feel like what they did have wasn't always being fully maximized. And of course, this was so clear and obvious with the quarterback position. And Justin Fields was obviously the, the most recent strong example of like offense that was not built for him 
he was really plugged into the Andy Dalton offense and he's a very different quarterback than Andy Dalton and really struggled to force in those three-step drop West Coast quick underneath throws that Matt Nagy seemed to be so dead set on having as part of his offense. And the deep shots for fields were still in there, but they were a little bit fewer and far between and wasn't necessarily setting him up to move out of the pocket, wasn't setting him up with you know, the right protection for these longer developing plays. And it really took a lot of time for the scheme to slowly adjust to what Justin Fields did well. And it's got to be a primary focus. And we've heard, we've heard the entire new Bears coaching staff talk this line over and over again about putting the players in the best position to be successful and adjusting the scheme to fit the talent. But words are words and, and actions speak louder. And I felt like we had heard Matt Nagy say, Oh, we're going to put the the players in the best position to be successful, right? He he wasn't like intentionally not putting players in the best position to be successful, unless you want to put your tinfoil hat on with Allen Robinson specifically. But like certainly, they weren't trying to sabotage Justin Fields or Andy Dalton or any of these players individually because they were trying to win games to save their jobs first and foremost. Like they don't have a lot of incentive to make Allen Robinson particularly worse because they got fired as a result, and they would much rather keep their jobs than spite Allen Robinson, but regardless, like that, that was a big issue with, with fields. And it was an issue with Mitch Trubisky where it took until the second half of what 2020 for them to have Bill Lazor switch the entire offense over to more of like a Shanahan style stretch zone, West coast kind of rollout offense for Trubisky. And all of a sudden the offense kind of picked back up and they ended that losing streak, but it took three and a half years to tweak the offense to the quarterback as opposed to spending three and a half years trying to get the quarterback to fit in the offense and how backwards that was, despite some of the, so many of the times we heard the coaching staff saying they were trying to fit the scheme to the player and, and not the other way around, but it's not just the quarterback spots, right? Those are the obvious, easy to see situations. I would throw Robinson in there in terms of not so much it being fully intentional, but just that it, it not being a scheme utilization of Robinson that was going to be most conducive to his production and therefore the team's success. You know, he still ran the majority of his routes were curl routes. The PFF data came out in the QB annual, I believe. And it was, or it was either in the QB annual or one of their, one of their data outputs showed Allen Robinson's top routes. And it was I think curl routes, out routes. And I don't remember what the third one was, but clearly not, getting him involved as much downfield where he can win, not getting him involved as much over the middle of the field again, where he can win and just not, I mean, clearly taking a player who's been a 1400 yard receiver and limiting him to however, you know, 38 catches or whatever he had this past season was very much uh, a misuse of a player's talent. You know, we can, we don't need to rehash the whole Allen Robinson conversation. Again, we did a podcast last week about whether or not the Bears should resign him, but like you can argue whether or not he gave hundred percent effort or whatever things you want to throw out there. But like, he didn't all of a sudden become a terrible wide receiver, right? I mean, he's still a very, very talented player. And, and at some point, like, it's coaching staff. I mean, it's it's quarterbacking, too, and it's scheme. It's offensive line. It's not. But, like, at some point there, there there's a real problem there that, that goes with how he was being utilized. I also think David Montgomery has not been utilized to his fullest with the Bears. And this is not so much, like, scheme in terms of play design, but just the number of games, especially early on in the Nagy regime, or early on in Montgomery's career with the Nagy regime, of where the ba- the running game would just be abandoned. You know, the, the game against the Saints where they handed it off like six times or whatever that number was. I mean, just sometimes ridiculous lack of going to the running game and therefore lack of supporting your quarterback with a good running game and all those different things. And the running game is not purely the key to offensive success, but it is uh, an important factor with young quarterbacks that are either struggling or at the very least developing along the way. And that was not consistently enough of a part of this Bears offense. And therefore Montgomery also then like not being utilized to his fullest to put him in the best position to be successful. I think this was mostly exclusive to the Bears offense. I mean, you can throw in somebody like maybe Cordero Patterson, maybe not being utilized fully and some of the other weapons around there a little bit, but the only one that really comes to mind defensively is Eddie Jackson. And we kind of thought after 2018, you know, when they switched to, to Chuck Pagano's defensive scheme, they did go to more single deep looks and more of those sort of cover three, cover one stuff than we, we saw under Vic Fangio, even though they kept a lot of the same general scheme principles. And it wasn't a drastic change for Eddie Jackson, but it still didn't seem like exactly what was best for him. It was kind of what the Bears wanted to run, and they thought, well, Jackson can do that pretty well. But then th- what complicates it is coming back to Sean Desai as a defensive coordinator 
getting back to more of the Fangio like coverage splits and still not getting much better Eddie Jackson production makes you, it, it goes to show that perhaps scheme isn't the full factor there, isn't the only factor in Eddie Jackson's decline. But I do think there have been very legitimate criticisms of how Eddie Jackson was used as the Bears' safeties, particularly under Matt Nagy in the Chuck Pagano years, more, more so than the other years. And again, they start, they talk all the time about we're going to do what's best for the players and what will help them be successful. But every coach says that and not the coaching, not every coach does it. And, and it seemed like Matt Nagy and the coaching staff prior wasn't able to consistently recognize when they were and were not properly adjusting to fit the talent of the players that they have. And it's something that I hope Matt Eberflus is able to actually do and follow up on same with Luke Getzey, the offensive coordinator, and not just say it and then not have the action sort of match their words. Because sometimes that that difference between words and actions and really the, the actions that you you do take can make it can make a huge difference. And I think one of the things that you can look to from the previous regime as a as a good lesson to learn was when when they were able to admit some of their mistakes. We'll kind of look at, I guess, when they did it and when they didn't, and what we can kind of take away moving forward next on Locked On Bears. It's going to be a lot of different moving parts for Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus to work through here early in their time running the Chicago Bears. And hey, if you're interested in moving parts, need some parts moved to you, our friends at rockauto.com are going to be the best place for all of your auto parts needs. Such an increasing numbers of makes and models nowadays, it can be impossible for your local chain part store to have all the parts you need in stock. So most of the time you go there, you talk to somebody behind the counter, they ask you a bunch of either like pointless questions or like kind of intimidating questions. And then they either look in the back or they check in their computer and order it. And then you, you're paying for the middleman there. You cut, cut all that out and you have the same access to even a greater depth of parts from our friends at rockauto.com. Their catalog is so deep. I don't think you can find anything close to it online. But it's really easy to navigate. Like you're never, you're not going to get lost in there. You just enter in your car's make and model, and then it pulls up all the different parts and you can sort between them, the brands, specifications, and prices that you prefer. Those prices are particularly important because some of the chain stores will have a different price tier for the professional mechanics versus the do-it-yourselfers like us. But rockauto.com's prices are the same for everybody. So don't spend up to twice as much for the same parts somewhere else. Head on over to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. When you check out, write, out, write down the words locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com One thing I'll give Ryan Payson, by extension Matt Nagy, some credit for, for, for I think growing on over the years was being able to admit their mistakes after some time and and how admitting your mistakes and not, not they weren't like openly saying it, but in their actions, admitting their mistakes is better than holding on to them too long. And we saw that be a bigger issue, I think, earlier on. I think the one that comes to mind right away was Ryan Pace's first draft pick, Kevin White, right? They, they really wanted to make Kevin White work and make Kevin White happen. And it was never Kevin. I mean, it, it was I, I don't blame Kevin White for the injuries that he suffered. Right. It was not his fault that he was unable to provide the Chicago Bears fully what they were hoping from him, for him from him, hoping for him from the first pick in that draft. But every year, it was, I mean, they just kept trying and trying and trying and toting him back out there. And eventually, and eventually they cut him loose and he really wasn't able to stick in the NFL. And, and I get you, you really want to maximize that first round pick and hold on to your asset and hope and make sure that you know you're not going to let a really good player walk out of the door. But it felt like they held on to him for a bit too long. And in any of these that they held on to too long, it wasn't like there were, you know, dire consequences as a result of, of too much of these. You know, like, for example, I, I give them a lot of credit for essentially admitting the mistake on Mitch Trubisky and, and letting him go and moving him on and not hamstringing themselves by giving Mitch Trubisky, say, a lucrative contract extension and, and saying, you know what, go for it. We're going to make this work. We'll pay you big bucks. It'd be like Trubisky the way we have seen other quarter, quarter or other teams fall into that quarterback purgatory 
by extending quarterbacks and paying them a lot of money when they're not giving you the consistent enough production for your team. And that's where I think you see some of the the lesson learned and, and where you see where Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus need to make sure they're also following up on that lesson. Because I think back, you know, like Riley Ridley, you know, they tried, he, he was a part of this roster for three or four seasons and it was like never able to crack the lineup and always taking that roster spot. And again, the stakes there of him holding on to a roster spot are not great, but you know, it wasn't until they really sort of gave up on Riley Ridley and then gave up on Anthony Miller and gave up on Javon Wims that we saw them put any sort of real turnover into this wide receiver position to try and at least start to build it up a little bit more. And obviously like Marquise Goodwin and Demir Bird didn't really end up producing that for them, but at least it was like a recognition that, Hey, the young guys that we've been holding on to and trying to develop in Miller, Ridley and Wims were not getting there. And so they were like, okay, we need to do something different as we start of transition here at quarterback and need to build a, a new offense here. Let's get some new wide receivers in there. And now the new regime has a new opportunity to build some new wide receivers in there too. They were short term replacements that we saw this year, but again, an admission of like, all right, we have to move on from these young players that we wanted to work out. Of course we drafted them. We thought they would work out and they just did not develop at the level or at the speed that the team wanted them to. And maybe they held on to Ridby a little bit too long, but at least it was an admission of like, okay, this is not going to work. Same thing I think we saw at tight end quite a bit, right? Signed Deion Sims, tried to make the Deion Sims thing work for a while, eventually sort of admitted, yeah, that one's not going to work. Did they hold on to him too long? I mean, maybe, but it wasn't like five years of trying to pretend that this was going to work. Same kind of thing with Trey Burton, right? They gave it a couple of years and then they were kind of ready to say, screw it. As soon as we can get out of this contract, we need to do it. Or even, you know, Adam Shaheen, they didn't even wait to see him out through the end of his rookie contract. You know, they traded him and got that six round pick or, or conditional late round pick to train him to the Dolphins, right? It, holding on to some of those guys and trying to make it work for a while and then admitting, you know what? We got it wrong again with, with tight end. I mean, Jimmy Graham's kind of a continuation of this, right? Where it's felt like they held on to Jimmy Graham one year too long, right? That the salary, they backloaded his contract and had a big cap hit this season. Didn't, I mean, he was a red zone target, but like Jimmy Graham clearly wasn't making their offense all that much better considering where the offense was still struggling with him. And that salary cap relief could have gone to a, keeping Charles Leno or, or Bobby Massey or maybe Kyle Fuller. I mean, either improving offensive tackle or improving quarterback or improving somewhere else on your roster and getting more with that money than you could have gotten out of what you got from, from Jimmy Graham, just not doing all that much. Again, it feels like a lot of these tended to be on the offense because the, the massive defensive mistakes aren't quite there. And there's the dual sided coin of this of like, good thing. They didn't get rid of Robert Quinn after one season, although they didn't really have the means to, if they'd cut him, it wouldn't have made financial sense. They were locked into Robert Quinn for, for two seasons. And so like, there's something to be said about some amount of patience, right? You don't want to rush to necessarily like a one year overall judgment. I mean, unless it's like Mike Glennon levels of obviously bad, but like there's something to be said about giving things some time and being, having some patience to see things through giving it at least a season and an understanding that like with someone like Robert Quinn, there seemed to be some other factors behind the scenes that were not very public as to why he struggled in his first season in Chicago and why there was reason to think, you know, year two could provide something a little bit better there. But like the main defensive guy that I felt like maybe they held on to a little bit too long was Buster Screen, the slot cornerback. He was really not good when they signed him, not a super consistent player coming into Chicago not a super consistent player in Chicago and, and finally kind of moved on, but they also didn't really do a good job of replacing him because it was just, you know, like this past season, like Duke Shelley and eventually like Thomas Graham got some time there. Mark Reed Christian was rotating in there. It was the like, slot cornerback is not, was a mess and still needs to be fixed. But like, other than that, they've done a pretty good job defensively of not, not committing big resources into players that aren't able to provide. I mean, Eddie Jackson conversation is, is it's separate thing, but he's not, it's not ready to like, give up on Eddie Jackson time either, right? It's, it's still, still, he's still able to provide a lot for this defense and it's not so much a mistake, right? I mean, Eddie Jackson has been very, very good for this team and still can be, right? There's not, it's not like he's never done anything before. So I think I, I'm hope I'm hopeful that Iberflus and Poles can, can put their egos aside and, and be able to admit mistakes when they make them and not hold on to them and be detrimental to the team. Cause Matt Nagy said all the time, no egos around here. Matt, Matt, Matt Nagy says, I don't have an ego. Ryan Pace doesn't have an ego. We just want to do what's best for the bears. Sometimes it felt like there was some ego with holding on to players, some ego with wanting to force players to fit in your scheme and ego to think that the guys we're bringing in as a competition are going to be able to be talented enough just by competing, even though the talent itself 
might've been lacking a little bit there. So just some sort of big picture lessons. I hope Ryan Poles and Matt Everflus are taking from the previous regime. If there's other lessons that come to mind for you, I'd love to hear them. Let us know in the comments on the YouTube video here on the Lockdown Bears YouTube channel, or you can hit us up in the Lockdown Bears Facebook group to keep the conversation going there. Of course, on Twitter at Locked on Bears as well. Appreciate everyone who's been reaching out, everyone who's been a part of this conversation, a part of this little, I don't want to say call it a community around the podcast, but at least a conversation around the podcast. I appreciate those of you who are tuning in every day, making Locked on Bears your first listen. We're here for you five days a week on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We've got Locked In NFL looking at the more national level NFL shows and then the NFL storylines entering the combine now. Locked On NFL Draft is going to be a great spot for all of that and so many more shows covering, again, all the teams you could want here on the Locked On Podcast Network. So thank you for tuning in and I hope in exchange the Locked On Bears podcast is making it just a little bit easier for you to bear down.